thank you. Um, we're so excited that there are so many people joining us for this presentation about how to use mindfulness um, in the classroom. Um, we're going to introduce ourselves a bit first. So my name is Elizabeth Cadenis. I'm an associate professor of English at Community College of Philadelphia. I'm trained in mindfulness-based stress reduction, and I've really enjoyed incorporating mindfulness activities into my classroom for the past 10 years. My entry point into mindfulness was more personal. So mindfulness really helped me with anxiety and it also helped to facilitate eating disorder recovery for me. And then I was really excited about Kate's interest in mindfulness as well and sharing mindfulness with my students. Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Kate Sanchez. Um, you'll have to bear with me today. I have a bit of a cold, so my voice is not 100% and excuse any sneezing. Um, the head is very full right now, um, but we're gonna get through this. So I'm also a professor of English at CCP and um, also dabble in mindfulness. I'm a certified meditation and mindfulness teacher. And I've also created a YouTube channel for mindfulness exercises. I came to mindfulness um, also for health related reasons to deal with chronic pain and anxiety. Um, I have an illness with no cure and no, not a lot of treatments. So it was the one thing I can always cling to is mindfulness to kind of take the edge off of whatever I'm going through. And it looks like the results from the poll yeah. are in. 56% yes, 44% no. So that's wonderful to hear that some people are using mindfulness in your courses or maybe in your programs or your meetings with people. And um, also wonderful to have some people here who do not yet use it so we can share some of what we've learned with you all. So um, there are many challenges that you may be facing right now this semester. We've listed some of them here. And we also know that you've got a big list perhaps in your uh, head as well. So at this particular moment, there's the shifting classroom modality. So maybe you were online and then you were in person and then you were back online or some permutation um, of that. There's pandemic anxiety, worry about protecting families, um, also pandemic fatigue, be, having dealt with the pandemic for such a long time. There's the risk of infection, economic challenges for both faculty and students. We're dealing with a culture of disinformation and also political polarization. And then there's also shifts in the physical environment. A lot of weird weather stuff happening. You never know when there can be a tornado outside your window. Um, we also know that many people are supported and have wonderful um, networks that are helping them get through whatever challenges life is giving them. Um, and then others have fewer of those supports um, and it's hard to know who has what. And there's also a lot of um, world trauma that's going on. And if you read the news, it's really easy to carry that on your shoulders um, as you go throughout your day. And one of the things that we found is that anxiety, which all of these things can create anxiety among other things, anxiety can be really disconnecting. And it's really a good service to students if we can help them to decrease anxiety and find greater um, sources of connection. So there are a lot of possible solutions you know to these challenges and we're all trying to implement them to the best of our ability we're here to share the solution of mindfulness for ways to reconnect during this time especially if you know no matter where you're teaching online in person um, or whether you're a support staff um, mindfulness can really help to reconnect with each other in case you're not familiar with the term a basic definition is awareness without judgment. So essentially you're paying attention on purpose, that's awareness, right? Um, without sort of judging something or looking at it as good or bad, you're just sort of noticing it. What we have found in years of doing mindfulness exercises with students is that it does lead to college success. We have found tons of amazing benefits anecdotally in our students. Three of the most common are the ability to focus, whether 
trying to study at home, you know, with their families and their dogs and, you know, noise around them and, and stress or um, whether they're trying to focus in the classroom and be there in the moment and not thinking about something else. Persistence to get through obstacles and also just overall well being in college and in life. Um, there's an image on this screen of a person tripping and we included this because <laughs> awareness can help us to see obstacles in front of us that we might not notice if we're not metaphorically looking up, right? Looking around and noticing. Sometimes when we can look around and see and be aware of things, we can navigate an obstacle from a place of center and a place from more health and wisdom. And sometimes right now, if we can look up and look around us, we can actually see that we're really not alone in this. There are so many others um, at our institutions and around the country and world that are going through the same things we are, and we can use it as a way to connect. So we are here today to share with you how you can incorporate mindfulness into either your classroom or your program, maybe even just your meetings that you have with colleagues or students in just five to 10 minutes. So today we have four tips for you um, about how to reconnect with your students and with each other. So the first tip is to write a contextual meditation for your students. And sometimes when we think about um, connection, we think about discussions, we think about small group work, we think about talking with each other, um, but meditations can be profoundly connecting as well. So what you can do is to write a meditation for your students that relates to your content for that day or to something that has come up in your classroom dynamic. So you can write a meditation for focus. Maybe if you notice that students were taking out their phones or trying to hide them in their laps or something, and that was distracting, you could write about use of technology that's supportive for learning, um, write a meditation about that, or even it could, it could be about your course content, a meditation for beginning to learn um, about biology or a meditation for the first chapter of Jane Eyre. Whatever your content is, you can write a meditation that's specific to it. You can use meditation bells to start the meditation. These are available online for many different vendors if you don't already have them. Um, and then at the end, you can have uh, students write on the board about how they feel um, or in the chat if you're on a Zoom course. So writing these meditation meditations and having students do the meditations creates the shared experience of vulner vulnerability and looking inward. Sometimes you can feel the energy in the room when meditations are happening. And then finally, and probably most importantly, everyone is engaged in the present moment together. And that can be profoundly connecting. We're all leaving behind what has come before and what's going to come can leave our minds and we can engage in the present moment. So I've written um, a meditation for a webinar about mindfulness strategies, and we're going to do it now. So I encourage you to get as comfortable as possible wherever you are. And I'm going to start the meditation with the meditation bells, and I'll also end it with the meditation bells. Thank you for taking the time to tune into this webinar. You have been through a lot this year, but you have chosen to keep persisting anyway. Take a deep breath into your belly. Let it out. If you feel comfortable and you're not already doing so, close your eyes. Take a moment to think about all the good you contribute to others and listen with your body for any feelings that arise.
Now feel your feet against the floor. You are right here, right now, with a group of people who care about the well being of their students. This is something to celebrate. If possible, wiggle your fingers. Pat yourself on the back. We are here to support you in your journey towards greater awareness. Thank you for the work that you do in this world. When you're ready, you can open your eyes and slowly transition back to this webinar. Okay, so hopefully that was a nice moment to kind of get us started and warmed up today. As you can see, it just takes a few minutes to do something like this and it can really change the, the atmosphere in a room to do that. The second tip, oops, sorry. The second tip is to ask your students to draw the weather in their brains. So um, this is something that's more tactile, more art driven and um, what it does is it forces the students to go inward and really check in with themselves and then take whatever they find and express it outwardly in art. Um, there are lots of ways that we can use it to connect with each other. Um, one of them is your students can share with each other or with you and you can acknowledge and make them feel seen, their weather seen as you walk around the room. You can have a discussion about how the weather might impact their learning. When we do this with students, it's amazing how it creates a bonding experience that others are like, hey, you know, my brain is a thunderstorm as well, or my brain is also full of fog, or I have a little sunshine to spare. So it's really interesting to see how that works. Um, the next thing we're going to do is actually do the exercise. So if you have a piece of paper, something to write with, um, whatever you have sitting around, I have some paper and some highlighters so I'm gonna use that, um, but if you can take something out to write on, that would be great. We have some volunteers as well who will share um, after we've taken a little bit of time to do this. So great. we encourage Thank you. It looks, like, it looks like we have seven volunteers. So after great. the activity, please enable your camera to share your drawings. So I'll start the activity with the bells and then when, when we're finishing up, I'll ring the bells again. So I'd say probably about a, uh, maybe two minutes, Kate, does that sound yeah. good? Okay, yeah, simplified drawings, stick figures, anything like that is fine.
30 more seconds. That's good. Okay. People are ready. Good. If you are ready and you would like to share your drawings, um, you can hold it up to the camera. Mine is a sun with lightning coming out of it in a blue sky. Nice. Ste Ooh. Oh, Stephanie, do you want to say anything about yours? You can. <laughs> Yours disappeared kind of into the ether there. There you go. It did. Hi. Thank you both so much, Elizabeth and Kate, for this. Um, yeah, so mine is it's sun, but the clouds could kind of blow in at any moment. And sorry, I, I used words too, but <laughs> that's great. That's great. Yeah, there are no rules around how to do it. However, it's meaningful. I love that. Okay, good. Looks looks like we've got something from Heather. I see some clouds. Very nice. Do you want to explain it a little? You would? Yeah, mine is fog. I can't draw, but I, there's a little car here and I feel like I'm dry, driving into this huge cloud of fog and it's just slowing me down and stopping me and I don't know where I'm going and I can't see a thing. <laughs> yes, I can really relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, it's a very foggy time in life <laughs> for many of us. Great. Uh, any, would anybody else like to share? Like, any? Um, a couple more people are holding up their drawing. Oh, oh, I didn't see, sorry. Oh, that's a pretty sun. <laughs> oh. oh, a happy, so we've got some happiness, I see. And some, is that the ocean, Karen? You know what, it's just a little fuzzy on the, oh. Hi, everyone, I'm Karen. Actually, my picture is very similar to Stephanie's. Mm -hmm. And that it's overcast, but there is some sun there. It's just lots of things happening and trying to find my way over to the sun part. I hope you can see that. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Oh, Yvonne? Uh, yeah. Mine was also a sun with clouds and like the rays on me as I'm laying down, rest, resting and floating on a bed of um, the floating on the ocean. <laughs> nice. Love that. I like also that there's a there's elements of hopefulness in a lot of the um, weather that there's sort of shifting weather. It's great. Um, anybody else want to share, Jackie? <laughs> Mine's not so. Um, I have clouds with lightning. Um, and the noise, boom, boom. <laughs> What's um, at the bottom? Yeah, it um, kind of like tambourines. I didn't draw hands though. <laughs> Yeah. you know, beating the boom, boom, um, a lot of, uh, pain this year. Um, nice. I just had surgery. So my, on my foot, so I'm in a lot of pain there. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's kind of <laughs> the brain yeah. is like loud. Yeah. So when your brain is loud today. Yeah. Yes. I get Very that. loud. Yeah. That's wonderful. It's, um, it's helpful to be able to share however anything is going at any moment. That's what mindfulness is all about. That's fantastic. Thank you. And sometimes with an exercise like this, we don't realize the weather. We're not really conscious of the weather or the thought until we actually like consciously check in with it. And we do that awareness on purpose without judgment. So um, I hope you can see how this could be helpful for the students that you work with to be more aware of what's happening in their brains and also um, just to connect with each other a little more. Thank you so much for those of you who volunteered to have your camera on and, and share with us. That was wonderful. We really appreciate it. Okay. So the third tip is to create a mindfulness reading or problem of the day. So what you can do is with the full class, do a close reading of a single sentence from a book that maybe you're reading or solve a problem mindfully as a group, maybe a math problem um, with about one minute between each step for breath or a little bit less depending on what the problem is. Um, and then students can also write about their feelings about this activity or about a, an activity they've done in the past that connects with it. So doing this can be really helpful, especially if there's a lot of content that you wish to cover in a class, having a moment of pause with your content where you're just looking at one small part and then asking students to problem solve together slowly can be really fulfilling, especially because different learners who may not 
be willing to otherwise speak might speak, or they might find ways of sharing and problem solving um, that can be very powerful. And also you as the instructor in slowing down may find some things that you never saw before in some of your content. So this is an example from a molecular biology textbook that I just found online. This is not my area of um, study, but I thought it was a really interesting sentence that we could look at um, together. So the sentence says, to carry out its information bearing functions, DNA must do more than copy itself. So I pause for a breath in the middle. I'm gonna read it again to carry out its information bearing functions, DNA must do more than copy itself. Then you may wanna pause a little bit, maybe have students write a little bit, um, just find some space. And then what you can do is ask students questions that you might not normally ask them. So the questions that I've written below are questions that I probably wouldn't you know, in a normal class choose to ask my students. So if these are questions that you might ask, you would come up with different ones. And it's just asking, trying to engage different parts of your students' brains in this mindful way. So what is one interesting part of the sentence? What emotion did you feel when you read this sentence? This can be connecting too, because some students might say, you know, they felt bored or they felt anxious or they felt excited. And in this small way, getting students to share their feelings, um, it can be less intimidating than them having to come up to you and say, hey, like, I really don't understand anything that's happening in this course, right? That's really, that's such a vulnerable place to be for students. But if you can create these little problem solving activities where folks can work together and share freely, that can be so powerful. Um, and then you can do more creative engagement where you take the subject and then you connect it personally, regardless of what the subject is, like what are your information bearing functions and how do you express them? So we're going, we're, yeah, we're gonna go to the next one. Oh, okay. Um, so the last tip that we have for you today is we have lots more tips, but these are, we're gonna limit ourselves today um, is to create a class intention. So. This exercise started for me about 10 years ago um, when I was actually teaching at Harrisburg Area Community College. Um, I know some people are from that area um, who are on the webinar today. And um, I just noticed that, you know, sometimes when you walk into a classroom, it just feels like the energy is off. It seems like people are anxious, they're not focused, they're thinking about something else, they have stress and trauma that they're bringing with them into the room. And I was trying to figure out how do I kind of clear the space? So I tried, I tried this and I said, look, here's what we're gonna do. When you walk through the door, you have to set a positive intention, not 10 goals, just one positive intention for class today. So we started doing that. And it was just incredible to me, the way the energy has changed um, in the room, the way people were able to focus, be in the present moment, let go of, the other things. It was really helpful. It's not perfect. Like we're not always all going to be able to pay attention 100%, but it really did help the energy in the class and also connecting with each other. Um, to this day, I begin every class and every meeting with people setting intentions because I think that it's important. And I think that it creates um, a sense of productivity combined with um, awareness and presence. So one thing you can do in your classes or with a group that you work with is brainstorm a positive group intention, either for class or for the week. For instance, um, let's say your students are having trouble listening to each other. They're sort of thinking about what they're going to say next instead of really listening to what the person is saying. Maybe we set a group intention for class today that we're really going to just listen to each other and be open to each other. Um, so I think you could see how that would be connecting. What you can do is write it on the board or the screen. If you have an online class or a learning management system, you could post it on your welcome page so that students can check in with it. Um, creating these pauses to look at the intention and remind ourselves that this is what we're striving for. Um, and I think it's also important that we emphasize the difference between 
results-driven and process-driven goals. So results-driven goals are things that, you know, we want to get to this certain point. Um, you push yourself, you push through. This isn't necessarily like that. We're just working on something. We're trying to get better at it. We're intending to listen better, you know, and we're working towards it. So we check in and see how we're doing. Um, this is really great to create like a brand for your class or a culture for your class. Something that's going to tie the community together can be really helpful, especially I think in like online asynchronous learning, which is I teach mostly asynchronous online classes. And um, this is a way that I can help build community among the students. So we're going to give this a try, but just as individuals today. So what I want you to do is create a personal intention for the rest of your day today. So um, if you have a piece of paper or your phone or a post-it, you can write it down and then post it somewhere you'll see it often. So places like the bathroom mirror beside your bed, in your car, in the cabinet above where you wash dishes or the window. Um, these are all places that I kind of go to, but um, you might have other ideas where you could put it so you see it often. Um, and we also want to invite you at this point, if you feel like sharing, you could type your intention in the chat so we can all see what each other are focusing on and what we're working toward today. We'll take a brief moment to write our intentions. I love the intentions that are popping up in the chat. Thank you so much for sharing you all. I also really appreciate um, Heather uh, made us, Heather Olson made a great suggestion of starting every class with a mindful minute of breathing, um, followed up by gratitude and a quick share. Um, that's fantastic. Happy birthday, Rebecca. Oh, happy birthday. birthday. <laughs> <laughs> great. Celebratory intentions. And I like also that Jennifer talks about um, not overworking. Some of you have mentioned that. Um, be kind to yourself. Some of you have talked about enjoying yourself, enjoying your work. You know, like we can either like enjoy our day or not enjoy our day. And we have a choice, you know, to some extent that in our brains, we can decide that things aren't optimal, but I'm going to try to get the most that I can out of this. Okay. And this is something that you can do in meetings um, with one-on-one -on -one with students or with colleagues. It's also something you can do with your, uh, the soccer team that you coach or the youth group that you mentor at your church, or, you know, you can use this particular exercise in so many different ways in your life. Okay. So um, if you like these ideas, we hope that you will consider adopting the College Mindfulness Workbook, which we've just published with Kindle Hunt. This is the book. It has over 100 activities like the ones in this webinar um, to help you foster student success during this time and beyond. It's organized into 15 um, student success themed chapters um, that can be used for really any course. Um, and, or if you have a first year experience course, it can be the text for the course. Um, it has easy instructions for faculty and students so that you don't have to prep before using it. If you um, want to just go into the class and read the instructions with students and do a few activities, it will work. Or if you want students to do them for extra credit um, or for homework, they will understand the instructions. Um, it's a six by nine format, which we're excited about, and it has perforated pages, so it's portable. Um, students can take their work out of the book. Um, it's also available as an ebook. Um, we found that it works well online and in person, and we're having really good success using it this semester with our students. 
And one of the things that was really, really important to us was to work with a publisher who would be flexible enough to allow the book to be $30, less than $30, because we know that students are financially um, pressed and, and are facing a lot of challenges. And we wanted it to be something that they could be proud to hold in their hands, but that, wouldn't, that would still be affordable for them. Um, and we hope that you'll consider adopting the workbook too, so that it can have health over time and that it can help to spread um, mindfulness practice through higher education. Um, so we found that students really enjoy having uh, the physical book uh, charting their progress over time. Um, and it's been really, really beautiful um, for us to watch. So we are going to take questions in a moment. Um, first, I wanted to thank Matt Blue and Ryan Brown and the whole team at Kendall Hunt for um, just being so amazing to work with and believing in our project and also for hosting this webinar today so we could meet all of you. Um, and we do hope that many of you out there will reach out to us and keep in touch and ask questions and we can start a dialogue about what we introduced today and, and what you're doing. Um, we'd like to learn from you too. So we're going to end the webinar before we take questions with a pause. My favorite time to do mindfulness with students is in the last two minutes of in-person class when everyone's packing up and like their bags are sometimes like strapped on and they're like, as soon as like you're done, they're gonna run out the door. Um, I like to just say like, let's sit for a moment um, and just like be with that. So if you have um, some notes or questions you wanna write down, you can do that. And if not, you can sit and, and see how you're feeling. Are you trying to race out of the webinar and get to your next thing? Or for like a couple more minutes, can you just be present and breathe? And then we'll take questions. Thank you so much for um, listening. We love questions and um, you can type them in the chat if you'd like to. Uh, Ryan Brown is gonna be monitoring the chat for the questions. Our emails are also on the screen if you would like to email either one of us or both of us with anything that came up or just to say hello, we welcome your emails. And to share ideas too. It sounds like so many of you already use mindfulness and we'd love to be you know, collaborate, collaborating in, uh, and hearing what you have to say. Thank you so much, Kate and Elizabeth. Um, personally, I'm thankful to see no drawings of Sharknados in these, <laughs> in these weather pictures. So thank you for that. Um, I do have several questions here um, and please keep them coming um, using the Q&A or, or chat functions. But the first one, do you differentiate between the brain and the mind, especially with that weather exercise that we, we spoke about earlier? Mm. Um. Do you want to take that, Kate? Between the brain and the mind. I'd be, I'm, I'd be so curious to know what the, the um, person who asked the question, I'll bet that that person has a, a distinction between the two. Um, so I would um, like yeah. the brain is sort of more of like the logical, the thinking, whereas the mind is sort of the more, the, the more like soul connected, if we want to, part of it where we're more connected to our higher self and um, sort of paying attention and, and not judging and moving with things. So um, we don't have a lot of, um, like in our book and in our classes, I don't think that's something that we focus on a whole lot, although we do it not with those terms, yeah. but we do differentiate between like thought and feeling or thought and, um, you know, action, you know, different things like that within our mindfulness practices to show that there's a difference between what we're thinking and who we are. 
Yeah. And if, who, if whoever said that wants to email us too, to say more about what yeah. they, they're thinking, that's, that's fascinating. So <laughs> thank I do you just message her to see if she'd like to expand on it, but, <laughs> okay. but thank you. Um, and I'll keep you posted on that. Um, we're getting a lot of traction. A lot of people want to know where they can buy the book. So I've just um, included the, the URL to that. Um, and that'll take you directly to the books page. And there's not a specific amount that you need to buy. Um, you can order a single copy or you can order a whole classroom set. Um, I prefer if uh, you purchase for the entire school, right? <laughs> right <Take a> <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> but um, yeah, there is a link on there. And, and I will let you know that you're getting a recording of this webinar along with Kate and Elizabeth's email address and information on how to buy the book. So we'll send all that to you in the coming days as well. And on that, um, that link that Ryan sent out to you all, there is a table of contents, there are student testimonials, as well as a variety of videos that we've made about like how and why to use the book that might be helpful as well. Have the two of you ever encountered someone resistant to mindfulness? Yeah. Yes. You thought it was a waste of time. Yes. <laughs> Do you want to, do you want to, can I talk about this a little yeah, bit? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, we often um, find people who feel that um, mindfulness is going to take away from the speed at which they can deliver content, or, I mean, so many of us are really stressed and there's a sort of counterintuitive quality. We're saying, please get in touch with how you feel. That can be really scary for people. Um, and so especially at Community College of Philadelphia, we've had folks who have been um, usually professors who are really ready to embrace it and some that are less so. And I, I think that when um, professors have started to use the book with students, they've felt calmer about using it because not all the activities are, um, you know, about meditating or the traditional things you'd think when you think of mindfulness, we are hitting it from all different angles and professors can choose which activities to do with students. I will say that the students overall tend to be pretty receptive. And sometimes, you know, we have judgments about, you know, the type of student who would like this or not like this. But I think across the board, um, students have been interested in tending to their well-being and emotional health. So a lot of times the resistance that we get is on the part of um, faculty members who are not who are not quite ready. And I think that that's, you know, that's fine too. And it might be fine to have a conversation uh, with those people or really just to when they're ready, you know, they'll, they'll come to it if it feels important. And I think also with students, um, you have to emphasize in the teaching of it that not every mindfulness modality works for everyone. Like for instance, I have, I get anxious when I do like adult coloring books, with the little tiny places to color. And I, I can meditate for a long time, but it's hard for me to do the coloring. And I have had student, probably like one a year and I use mindfulness in all my classes. Um, I have about one student a year who will say, I thought that the coloring was juvenile, but then I'll have like 25 students every year that will say, this coloring was so helpful to me. I'm going to put coloring materials in my study space for study breaks so that I could help, you know, stay focused more, so. Students can choose what they take from it, you know, and what, and what they like. And I really, I, I struggle with the um, physical activities. So there are some physical activities in there like classroom yoga and walking, mindful walking. And um, I always wanna avoid doing them with students. And then when I do them with students, they're some of the most meaningful ones that we do. Thanks for that question. How, how long does a typical activity take? So activities take between five and 10 minutes. We've um, made them so that they can be short, but you also can expand them using uh, classroom techniques like small group work or discussion or bringing in maybe TED Talks or YouTube clips or other things you might bring in um, to you know, expand them. Or you can work through a full chapter really in a class period. And, and do you utilize this on a daily basis in your courses? Yeah, I do. Um, so we take time at the beginning of the class um, uh, of each of my classes and we work on some mindfulness practice. Um, a lot of times I'm using activities that link in with the other content for the day. Um, and yeah, students respond well when we use it a lot. Great. Um, and you, you, going back to the, the brain and mind, uh, question. Uh, Rebecca did reply, um, which is great. So 
Um, she mentions in her teaching of mindfulness, we talk about the brain being the mechanics, the physical embodiment, whereas the mind is the connective and personality center. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we have some activities that relate to this idea of monkey mind and being able to um, uh, recognize the thoughts as they come without judgment. Um, and there's a, an activity in there about letting thoughts that are not serving you drift, drift away. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I have two more questions if, if you have time. Um, what was your goal with creating this publication? So uh, Elizabeth and I have been doing this for a really long time. And we just decided at, at one point, let's just put together a workbook. Let's just start gathering the stuff we've been doing and share it with other people because it's really working. Um, we have had so many success stories with students using mindfulness and then taking it out. Like for instance, I had a student who was a manager at Walmart and she swears that she changed the culture of Walmart by taking the mindfulness exercises we did in class into her store. Um, and then I've had students who they go home and they do so many students go home and do the exercises with their children or with their friends or with their roommates. And um, there's, this, there's this way of doing it in the classroom that kind of filters out. So we wanted to share, we just want people to be aware of how helpful this can be for students. We also, in all of our searching, couldn't find a book that did this. So we, we created it. Um, and one of my students just said to me this semester, um, this is the first time she's ever been introduced to mindfulness in higher ed or in education in general. And we just feel like that's a disservice that students are not being introduced to something that can be so helpful to them. So in that way, we want to, to spread this. We wanna help teachers to implement this with students and um, just in the end, it's really about the students and making their path through college easier. Outstanding, outstanding. Um, one other question, what courses, I know you had mentioned, Elizabeth, I think you talked about the biology, the, the blurb you found, what other courses has this been used in in the past? So um, we've had people from all different disciplines and courses and even student services, counseling, advising, um, use this in their work with students. Um, in my classes, I teach English um, and I'm using it currently in my research paper class to just help students get through the semester and get through the challenges of this course, this intense writing course. But also I do a happiness theme so I can tie it thematically into what we're doing and look at, at happiness from the perspective of mindfulness and how they integrate. Um, I also teach, oh, go ahead, Elizabeth. Someone's also using um, the book in between, in a break between lecture and lab for uh, science for chemistry class. So I think that's an innovative way to use the book too. Yeah, um, in FYE, we use these exercises at CCP for the well being part of the course, that learning objective, and students really cling to it. Um, but we've had people, the nursing program at CCP uses a lot of our exercises um, and people use it in a lot of different ways in their different courses. Like if you were a counselor, maybe you would do an exercise in a meeting with a student. Um, if you are, you know, like Elizabeth said, if you're teaching a, like a, a science heavy course or maybe you're teaching like calculus, something that's difficult for students to learn, you can do it for brain breaks in class to help, you know, when the fog starts, like many of you, the fog starts coming in, we can try to clear it out a little bit and, and not have all that build up um, in their minds. So to answer the question <laughs> more shortly, it go anywhere. We've made it very open so that the, the book and the exercises can be implemented in any program.